Well, good morning, church. As you can see, the children are being dismissed. This is the time when they go off to their classrooms. And for the rest of us, I would encourage you to grab a Bible and open up to the Gospel of Matthew. We're making our way through this Gospel. It's, it's quite the journey. It's such a blessing to sit at the Lord's feet, the closest thing we have to uh, those who were able to walk with him and talk with him and eat meals with him. Uh, we, 2,000 years later, can come and sit at his feet and be taught by him through his scriptures. And so, uh, yeah, turn to Matthew chapter 25. Let me pray as you're turning there and, and we'll ask the Lord's help on our time. Jesus, we come before you, we come in your name, we come because of you, and we ask that you would be our helper, that you would send the helper to help us to understand these things. We thank you that you did send him and that he revealed these things to the apostles who were faithful to write them down and that your church has uh, borne this book um, all these years to bring it to us today. And here we are, Lord, 2,000 years on this side of the cross, still hoping, still waiting, still praying, still longing for your return. And whether we're the final generation or whether we will pass off the baton to the next generation, Lord, we, we want to be faithful in all that we do and say. And Father, I pray that you would help us now to be true disciples of our Lord, to be submitted to him, to truly bow our hearts before his word. We recognize that this is the expression of your authority. We love your word. We love that you tell us how to live. You don't just leave us to, to figure things out on our own, but you are a good and gracious God. Please be with us. Please be with those who aren't able to be with us this morning, Lord. I know there are many who are sick or, or hurting or uh, away for whatever reason, and I just pray that you would strengthen them, encourage them, and um, be with them, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Matthew 25 is proving to be an amazing passage. Um, not that any passage isn't. <laughs> it's kind of a funny thing. Uh, every passage I'm in is all my new time, you know, my all-time favorite passage um, until I turn the page and find a new one, and then that one's my favorite. But I think that's the, the glory and the wonder of God's word. It is not just man's words written down, but this is a, a living, breathing book, and it, it fills us up, and it tears us down, and it gives us everything we need for life and godliness. So Matthew 25, just to, by way of reminder, we're in, a, in the middle of, or finishing up really, a text where Jesus is speaking to his disciples in private, He's responding to a question they have, which came at the a prophetic word that he gave, that all the stones of the temple would be torn down. And, and they say, when, Lord, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus begins to, to speak to them. And there are things early on in chapter 24 that, that very much look like the things that would happen in AD 70. Uh, I think ultimately foreshadowing what did happen in AD 70 would ultimately foreshadow what will one day happen again uh, in the future. But now we're well beyond those things. We're clearly into the, the future things where uh, Jesus, has says, Jesus says back in chapter 24, but concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father only. Disciples probably in every generation, have concerned themselves with the when question. When will it be? What should we expect? Is it this? Is it that? Is this person this fulfillment? Is this nation this fulfillment? And I think um, that's part of our longing is to try and, you know, identify things safely and um, without being dogmatic on stuff. But ultimately, what I think Jesus wants us to take away from, and what we most certainly can take away from this passage, is that there are certain things that are absolutely true. They are at the core and the very center of our Christian beliefs. And to deny these things is to deny Christianity itself. Jesus will 
return. Physically, bodily, he will come out of the clouds, he will establish himself on this earth, he will destroy his enemies, and he will rescue his people. Amen? So to deny any of those things is to put yourself out of the the pale of orthodoxy, to, to call yourself an unbeliever. This is, uh, these are difficult things for sure, and until they're fully fulfilled, we won't know exactly what it'll look like, but there are things that we should absolutely hold dear. Jesus will return. This is, this is something that would have been strange, a little bit strange for the apostles in the first century, because as they've come to know him, they've come to accept that he is truly the Messiah. They've come to submit their lives to him as not only the son of man, but the son of God. There were things about Jesus' life that were undeniably true. They saw the miracles. They even partook of the miracles themselves. And they heard his teaching. They said he teaches as one who, who has authority. Everything about him was, was different. And they had come to acknowledge and submit to the idea that he was the Messiah. In their concept of a Messiah was built on the the things that were taught in the Old Testament. And I just want to give you a kind of a brief tour, very brief tour, just kind of a a skip across the top, so to speak, of the Old Testament, and where this all began. You see, back in Genesis chapter 1, God created man in his own image. Male and female, he made them in his own image. And he gave them a very specific task. He gave them the authority to rule over and have dominion over everything that he had created. At the pinnacle of God's creation was mankind. Adam was given the task to name all the animals, which expresses authority. He had authority over them. Everything was was put in order, and God made man and said, here, rule it and reign over it and bring it under your control. And whether they did that for three minutes or three years, we don't know. It doesn't tell us there in the the early pages of Genesis. But what we do learn is by Genesis chapter 3, something very tragic happens. Satan, that crafty and wily serpent, appeared to Eve in the garden and just simply started asking questions. And what he ultimately did was he exposed her weakness and her ignorance and then he exploited it and ultimately denied the goodness of God. She was given an alternative on what she would believe and she believed the enemy. And you know the rest of the story. Everything was plunged into darkness, into decay, into corruption. Everything was was twisted and bent and distorted like a bad car accident. All of creation, not just... Adam and Eve, but everything they had dominion over followed them into this destruction. Everything was brought under the corruption of sin. Ultimately, they handed that authority that God had given them over to the evil one. Now we're told throughout the Bible that the evil one, Satan, is the prince of the air. He's the ruler over these things, which is why you see the fruit of his life all over everything, which is why your life is hard which is why you have to wrestle through death and destruction and decay and perversion and all kinds of things like the rest of us. But here's the important thing, and here's the message of the Bible in a, in a small little verse. In Genesis 3.16, God knew everything that was happening. He was not caught off guard, and he said to the serpent, one day I will crush your head through the offspring of the woman. You see, God had a plan from the very beginning, before the foundation of the earth, before he ever spoke anything into being, he knew what the plan was, and the plan involved Satan interrupting everything and causing destruction. And God knew that part of the plan was that he was going to work through that destruction, and he was going to ultimately redeem a people for himself. So the promise is given that from the seed of the woman... God would raise up a deliverer, one who would rule, one who would restore, one who would make everything right, and ultimately one who would crush the head of the serpent. And that promise is developed throughout the Old Testament. The promise would ultimately come to uh, speak of the Messiah, the anointed one, the chosen one of God, God's special servant that he would send into the world 
uh, the Jews are the, the chosen uh, nation that God used to bring this Messiah into the world, and there are more promises given to develop and, and help us to understand who this person would be. Specifically, when we come to King David's life, David is a man after God's own heart, God says. He's a king over Israel. He literally rules over a people, over, he has borders and he has enemies. There's a physical kingdom that David is over. And David has it in his heart towards the end of his life to build God a temple, a permanent dwelling. And God says, it's a good desire, but you're not the right one. But he says in response, I'm going to build you a great name. I'm going to make your name great, David, and your kingdom will go on forever through one of your descendants who would sit on your throne and who would rule from the Davidic throne over not only Israel, but all of the nations. What we see in that promise is is the reaching back to Genesis chapter 3, God is going to raise up, as the New Testament tells us, the second Adam, the true and right and perfect Adam, the man who would come and accomplish all that God had given him to rule and reign over everything that he's made, to bring everything into submission to who he is and to ultimately offer praise and worship to God. The Jews had taken that promise and other promises along with it. There are many others that that help develop that theme, but they took that, and in their minds, all they could think about was conquering king. They were a small nation. They were mostly dominated by the nations around them, especially in the latter half of the Old Testament. So the longing was was to have a Messiah who would overthrow these dictators, who would overthrow these tax people that are taking all our money. And the disciples stepped into that very context And they believed on the Lord Jesus as their Messiah. And their expectation was, it's just a matter of time before he he overthrows the Romans and takes over and establishes his kingdom. They're ready for it. They're longing for it. They're waiting for it. But what largely goes unnoticed, among especially the people in the first century who, who beheld Jesus, was that Jesus would come first to deal with sin. Before he could ever establish a kingdom and before he could ever rule and reign, he had to deal with man's biggest problem, which was not the external enemy. Man's biggest problem is your problem and mine. It's the problem of our hearts. The corruption that we experience because of the inward fall. And so Jesus came the first time and John the Baptist recognized there's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And here we are 2,000 years later with a perspective that the early church didn't have, that Jesus came the first time to deal with sin, and he did, didn't he? Amen? He dealt with sin. He, He wrestled it all the way into the grave, and he left it for dead, and he rose victorious over it. And so, what was unclear to the disciples in the first century is very clear to us that Jesus came the first time in humility. His coming is marked by humility. His life is marked by service. He's the man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And ultimately, he laid down his life for his own. But there's another picture painted for us in the New Testament. Jesus has alluded to it already back in chapter 19. Turn over there real quick. In chapter 19, at the end of it, starting in verse 26, but Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Then Peter said in reply, see, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, in the new world, literally in the regeneration, when the son of man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. It's a promise that Jesus made speaking beyond the, the, the spiritual salvation that he was coming to bring and speaking to an ultimate day when he would come again. The spiritual 
salvation that you and I experience and enjoy and, and uh, love, this forgiveness of sins and the grace of God that cleanses us, teaches us to obey him, it is not complete. It's perfect, but it's, it's ultimately longing for a future day when it'll be made perfect and complete when we are redeemed in our bodies as well. There is a constant struggle in your heart and mine, if you're a believer, between what you want to do and what you ought to do versus what you actually do. It's a struggle we all find ourselves in. And ultimately, what we're waiting for and longing for is the redemption of our bodies, Ephesians 1 says. The passage that we're going to come to this morning, the passage that we have come to this morning, speaks of this future day, speaks of a day when everything will be made right. In fact, the heading in my Bible says the final judgment, and this is certainly talking about the finality of things. Let's read for, uh, let me read and you follow along, chapter 25, verse 31 to 46. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, Then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when do we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. This brings us to a close of this discourse that Jesus is giving to the disciples on the Mount of Olives. It's truly amazing, and it it speaks of things yet to come, but things that we ought to long for. You see, here we are 2,000 years on this side of the cross. Our hearts regularly look back to the cross, look back to the events. In fact, every time we celebrate communion, that's exactly what we're doing. We're looking back to the cross, because it it humbles us. It reminds us of the brokenness that we experienced when we realized our sin. It reminds us of the forgiveness and grace that is offered in Christ. But there's another aspect to the Christian life that ought to be central to everything we do. The Christian ought to regularly and often think about and long for the return of Christ. If it's something that is far from your thinking, it's because you're grown, you've grown too comfortable in this life. Suffering is our friend, ultimately, because it strips away the ivy of the world that tends to just grow up around us. It clings to us. And the suffering is the process of ripping that away and making us long for and loving the return of our Lord where everything will be made right. There's coming a day, church, when all the political woes of our world will be solved. When all the wars and rumors of wars will be silenced. 
when every suffering child will be nourished and fed and cared for. There's coming a day when the losers will be winners and the winners will be losers. It's the day when our Christ will return. The day, that glorious day, as it speaks of in verse 31, when the Son of Man comes in His glory. If you had to summarize with a word the the second coming, it would be glory. He's coming in glory. He's coming in power. He's coming in magnificence. The, The first coming was marked by humility and service in, in laying down his life, but the second coming is very different. Very different. In his first coming, people largely didn't recognize him. He came to his own, but his own received him not. But at his second coming, the whole world will recognize who he is. It will be glorious, it will be powerful, it will be undeniable, and it will be certain. Notice he says, when the Son of Man comes. He doesn't say if. He doesn't say, you know what, I'm going to go away and think about it and I'll decide if I'm going to come back or not. Wouldn't that have been horrible? He tells the disciples in John, I'm going away, but I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm going to come back and receive you to me. The Son of Man will return. He speaks of it matter-of-factly. The problem is, after 2,000 years, our hearts start to say, is he? Is it true? Is this just a story that's been written down that, that people like, or is this genuinely going to happen? The world has their ideas. The world mocks and scoffs and looks on and says, this is ridiculous. But for those who know Christ, for those who have tasted the first fruits of his grace in the cleansed heart, it's what we long for. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not satisfied until he comes. I'm not ready to just be here forever without him. And whether we're the first generation, or I'm sorry, the, the last generation before he comes, or whether we pass it on To the next generation, we need to be found longing and waiting for his coming. The second coming and the great separation, if you're you're trying to figure out a title, I was too on Thursday, so I didn't have it then. But I've got three points here. They help us just kind of walk through the text, three scenes really. The first one is the second coming and the great separation. The second coming, it's always summarized very succinctly and very simply. It doesn't give us all the details that our hearts long for, but it says enough. It says what we need to know, and that is the Son of Man, that is Jesus, is going to come in glory, and who has he come with? All the angels of heaven. Just to add to the scene, the glorious and powerful scene that is Christ coming out of heaven, there is arrayed behind him a whole army of angelic beings. I can't imagine the the thoughts that are going to go through the world's mind, collective mind, as they see this scene happening. Maybe they're going to think a Marvel movie is coming true. They're going to think, wait a second, are we living in a movie? We just need to look to our superheroes to help us. But their superheroes will not help them. The Son of Man will return. It will be glorious. It will be filled with awe and splendor and power. And the angels will be there as well. Why doesn't he give us more details? We don't need more than that. It's all we need. Then he will sit on his glorious throne. Here is where the scene changes from a heavenly scene to an earthly scene. You see, that is the goal. That is the the plan that God has orchestrated and ordained and put in place from before the foundation of the world. It wasn't a, a spiritual son of Adam that would come and overthrow the work of the devil. The work of the devil resulted in physical ailments. It resulted in physical death. And Jesus came to solve the spiritual problem, but ultimately he will come to solve the physical problem. Because it's not enough for your soul to be set free. 
if your body still decays. And the second coming will be the ultimate fulfillment of our salvation when the Son of Man comes in glory and establishes himself on this earth. That promise that we spoke of in 2 Samuel 7, the promise that was given to David that one of his descendants would sit on the throne of David forever and ever, this is him. This is Jesus. And the scene hasn't happened yet. It doesn't happen until the Son of Man comes in glory and then he will sit on his glorious throne. Right now he's seated at the right hand of his Father in heaven, but one day he will return from heaven because he's the the second Adam. He's the Adam that makes everything right. And Adam is an earth dweller. Adam is a man. And Christ in his humanity will come and make everything right and he will sit on his glorious throne. This is not a new concept in the New Testament. This is not something new. This should have been part of the expectation that was given In the Old Testament, in Zechariah 14, we read this in verse 4, part of verse 4, on that day his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives. This is referring to Lord, but but we know who he is. His name is Jesus, and he's going to come back to his people, and he's going to establish himself. It says literally his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. And then later in verse 5, it says, Then the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him. This is the same scene. This is the same event when the Lord comes out of heaven to establish himself and his kingdom on this earth. It's going to be a glorious day. It'll be a day that is undeniable. No one will miss it. No one will, will, will somehow escape it. It will be all-consuming. It's the culmination of all of human history. The glorious second coming. Verse 32, though, says there's something to follow that. Upon his return, and once he is established on his throne, ruling over not just Israel, but all the nations before him, verse 32, will be gathered all the nations all the nations, meaning every nation, meaning every people group, whether small tribe in the middle of the the Amazon rainforest or whether it means Russia, every nation will be gathered before him. And it's not just Israel and it's not just America, lest you think that America is somehow the new Israel. It's very self-centered thinking to think that somehow God loves America more than Mexico or more than Russia or more than North Korea. The reality is we love it because we're here and we're born here and we're raised to love it and that's good. But when it comes to the judgment, God gathers them all together. All the nations come before him. And if you read this and and you are are puzzled over how in the world this could happen, so am I. It doesn't answer this. And when we're not given the details, well, what is this going to look like? I don't know. I don't need to know. But I could ask the same question when we look back at Genesis 1 and God says, let there be light and there was light. How? I don't know. I don't need to know, though, but some people get all hung up in the things that we can't figure out in our little infinite or finite minds. They get all tripped up over these types of things, and they say, wait a second, all the nations gathered in one place? Yeah. A great gathering, unlike any gathering the world has ever known, will be gathered all the nations before him, and he will separate people one from another. You notice the distinction there. There's the great gathering of all the nations together, but when it comes to separating, it's based on an individual choice. It's based on an individual decision. He will separate people one from another. This people from that people, that person from that person, It'll be as though family units come before him and and these three go this way and those two go this way. 
It'd be as though a, a married couple comes before him and, and this one goes this way and this one goes this way. He doesn't say, this nation over here, you've been really good, and this nation over here, you've been really bad. The nations are gathered before him, but when it comes to separating, he is the all-knowing good shepherd. He separates individually, one from another, as, he uses a simile to tell us what's this, what is this like, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Some people refer to this as the parable of the sheep and the goats because of this imagery. I don't think that's accurate. In fact, I think that's quite opposite of what Jesus is trying to say here. He's not telling us a, a parable, which is a story to, to give us a principle to live by. He's telling us of real things. The Son of Man will return. The Son of Man will sit on a throne and the Son of Man will judge the nations. What will it be like? It'll be like a shepherd. The separation is what Jesus is drawing out from this imagery. As a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. This would have been a fairly common scene in the ancient Near East. Shepherds were plentiful. There were many of them. And you probably would have known a shepherd or known, a, known about shepherding at least. And, and the sheep and the goats would have, would have been together for most of the day. But then at nighttime, for whatever reason, and I've read different reasons, but the point is they're separated. The shepherd knows that the sheep need to sleep over here and the goats need to sleep over here. It doesn't tell us why they're separated. It doesn't, that's not the point. The point is that there needs to be a separation and the shepherd knows how to do that. So the shepherd separates out the sheep from the goats. Where once they were all flocked together and mingling together and eating together, now there's a separation. The sheep over here, the goats over there. As only the good shepherd can do. You think about the the enormity of this task all the nations of the earth gather before him and he knows his sheep he knows those who are his and those who are not and he will place the sheep on his right but the goats on the left the imagery is is quite simple it's similar to the imagery in the parable of the talents in the parable of the ten virgins there are two groups. There's the group known as the faithful, and there's the group known as the unfaithful, the wicked. There's a group known as the wise, and there's a group known as the, the foolish. And what Jesus is drawing out in all of these stories, in all of these uh, details, is this, that the shepherd knows the difference. Some of these parables, the previous parables, remind us that from our vantage point, we don't always know. But what is clear is that the shepherd knows. The shepherd knows those who belong to him and those who do not. And he shepher separates out the sheep from the goats, puts the sheep on his right. Why? Because the right is the place of honor. Where is Jesus seated now? He's seated at the right hand of God. He's at the place of honor the place of blessing, and so the sheep go to the right and the goats go to the left. And then we come in, in this passage to the next scene. Those on the king's right, he's going to say some things to them. He's gonna make a declaration. Then the king will say to those on his right, come. Don't you wanna hear the Lord say that? Come. Just that word alone is, is the, it's the, the great sigh of relief that, oh, it's done. Our labor is over. Our fighting is over. It's all come to an end. The Lord says, come. Come. I, I can't help but noticing it's the same word that he says back in Matthew 11 when he's speaking to the, to the lost sheep of Israel. And he says, come unto me, all you who are burdened and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It's the collective word of the gospel to, to sinners, come to Jesus and be saved. 
Come and have your sins washed away. Come and have your sins forgiven in the blood of Christ. It's the message and the word that's been spoken generation to generation to generation until he finally comes. But now he says it to his own, come. Those who have in their lifetime responded to that call and have come to the Lord and have had their sins forgiven, now they hear him say again, come. Come, you who are blessed by my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. The foundation of the world, yes, before Genesis 3, before Genesis 1, God had a plan, and the plan involved all of the details. God was not caught off guard. He's not responding to our decisions. He's not a a God out of control. He knows what he's doing, and all of this works in and is part of his plan. He has been orchestrating and working out a plan for our salvation and redemption. The foundation of the world means before Genesis 1. We're now into the mystery of God's mind that we we don't even know or understand, but we know this, that in his mind he makes sense of it. There's a kingdom that he has been preparing for all these years and generations and millennia. And the final day has come. Those on his right hear him say, come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit Inherit, meaning, meaning you belong to us and so you're going to get what we own. Not a reward for all your labors. Not a, not a payment for your good works. This is so important because so many people get all tripped up in this passage and they make it say things that it clearly isn't saying. Liberal theologians love to read what they see in this passage into all the other passages of the Bible And they make the Bible end up saying that uh, salvation is not by grace. That salvation is by good works. If you just do some good things, if you just do the right things, if you just help people around you. You know, be a good person. That's not at all what Jesus is saying here. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you. Inheritance is... For those in the family, how do you get into the family? You must be born again. You must be born again, John says, Jesus says. This is quite the declaration. Those on his right uh, have all kinds of questions, but they will ask one here in a minute. But Jesus first gives the evidence, first gives a some evidence of how he knows they're the right ones. How does the shepherd make a distinction between sheep and goats? Well, he has evidence. He has things that he looks for. He knows. Verse 35, four, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Six things, all of them communicating need. That's what they have in common, that this describes someone in need. And Jesus puts himself in the place of the needy person and says, I was this and you took care of me. You ministered to my need. And the obvious question that they all would would ask is, the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when... When did we do this? Before we get to their question, though, look at verse 37. Then the righteous, this is the first thing we know about them in terms of their character, in terms of who they are. Up to this point, they're just known as the sheep. We don't know if the sheep are the good ones or the goats are the good ones. But now we know the sheep are known as the righteous. But here's what's Interesting, the righteous 
don't even know themselves to be the righteous. The righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when? Notice they don't say, oh, of course we did. Oh, yeah, I remember. No, they're just as much confused as the second group in just a minute. When, Lord? When did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? It's a legitimate question. And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. First Corinthians 13 says, Love keeps no record of wrongs. Speaking of your love for someone else, you don't keep a record of their wrongs tallied up either in your mind or in a book. But I think we could equally say, Love does not keep a record of your own acts of righteousness. You don't keep a record of someone else's wrongs and you don't keep a record of your own acts of righteousness. You're not keeping a tally ledger in your mind or in a notebook somewhere of how good you are or how many good things you have done. These people are confused by this. When did we do this? Jesus' answer is that when you did it for one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. And there's an interpretive issue here. Who is... My brothers, who is Jesus referring to when he he refers to his brothers? Well, clearly it has to mean more than his physical brothers. He had stepbrothers, you know. Mary and Joseph had children, and those half-brothers were were of the same uh, maternal bloodline. But it has to be more than that because you and I don't even, how could we even find out who the brothers are of Jesus nowadays and who those relatives would be? And this is all the nations of the earth coming before him. Look over at chapter 12. I think Jesus gives us a very good clue. In fact, solves the riddle for us. Chapter 12, verse 46. While Jesus was still speaking to the people, behold, his mother and his brothers stood outside asking to speak to him. But he replied to the man who told him, Who is my mother? And who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my mother and sister, or my brother and sister and mother. What is Jesus saying? There is a family that is closer and more tight knit than any blood family. This will mess with your sensibilities a little bit because some of you are very close with your family. Some of you love deeply your family. And Jesus runs the the risk of offending his mother and brothers and sister, sisters, by saying, these disciples, they're my true family. The ones who do the will of my Father in heaven, they're the ones that belong to me. They're the ones that I give my life to. They're the ones that I call family. So here in chapter 25, Jesus is saying to these people, whatever you did to the least of these my brothers, meaning my followers, my believers, the people who have called upon my name, the people who identify with me, You did it to them, you did it to me. I can't help but just notice the the deep intimacy here. When you harm or hurt or come against a brother or sister in the Lord, you come against the Lord of heaven. When you mistreat or, or offend a brother, you offend Christ. This is the the truth that Jesus is saying here. It shouldn't be new to us, though. This is kind of the teaching of the New Testament. John chapter 13, verse 35, Jesus says, By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. 
Jesus tells his disciples probably really close to the same time frame in the, the life of Christ, within the, the closing hours of his life, he says, the, the whole world will know that you belong to me because not just you say you belong to me, not because you say you love my people or because you say you love me, they'll know because you actually love your brothers. There will be evidence of your words and your statements. 1 John 3, 16 and 18 says this, 2, 18. 1 John 3, by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. John now, years later, towards the end of his life, is writing to the people that have responded to the gospel, these Christians, and he's instructing them, and he says, here, it'll be really obvious. There will be evidence of whether or not you belong to Christ. You'll, you'll see your brother in need, and you'll realize you have what they need, and, and you'll help them. The world comes to those situations and looks on as they go on their way to collect more for themselves. But not a believer, not a brother of Christ, not a sister of Christ. They see needs of God's people and they jump at the opportunity. The inclination and impulse of the early church was those who had need and those who had some those who had some sold what they had to give to those who were in need. They didn't consult their financial advisor. They didn't think through, well, what would this mean for my kids' future? They said, Lord, if there's need, please, please let me take care of that. So it is in every generation. Those who belong to him show it. Verse 41, the scene changes yet again. It's really the same scene, but it's a different group. The goats on the left, verse 41, those on the king's left, also the king after those who have, were on the right, after they go in, after they depart from this scene and go off to receive their inheritance, the master turns to those on the left. And, and you would imagine with these people and who they are and what they're like, they're probably licking their chops. They're probably thinking, oh man, now it's our turn. I've been a good person most of my life. I've done a lot of good things. But all at once, Jesus crushes any hope that they might have. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me. Notice the, the stark contrast. To those on the right, he says, come. Come and receive. And those on the left, he says, depart from me. This is eternal death, separation forever. Death is separation. It's separation from our soul and our body. When, it, when that happens, and the, the two are, are separated Death happened in the garden in that first day when Adam and Eve ate that fruit and they died spiritually and they no longer loved God and they no longer wanted to love God. But here we have a final, a finality to this. Depart from me. Go away. You cursed, not the blessed, but the cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. God has been preparing a place for his people since the, before the foundation of the world. And likewise, there is prepared a place for all those who would not come. For the devil and his angels, first and foremost, those who initially rebelled against his authority, but throughout 
all of human history, all those who refuse to respond to the word of God, who refuse to come at his beckoning, who refused his invitation, he says, you have a place also which I have prepared. It's a place of torment and death. It's a place of fire. It's a place no one in their right mind would want to go. He has some evidence for them as well. He backs up his declaration with evidence. Verse 42, for I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and, and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer saying, Lord, when? When? I mean, I'm not a very religious person, but surely if Jesus came to me and needed some clothes, I'd give Jesus some clothes. And you just have to, if, if you were to extrapolate out this, this argumentation, this is how it would go. No, you wouldn't. You wouldn't do that. You wouldn't clothe Jesus. You wouldn't feed Jesus or give him something to drink. And how does he know this? Because he sent him plenty of opportunities. And rather than ministering to those who needed it, they passed on on their way so they could collect more for themselves. stingy, miserly heart that says, if I give some to them, then I'll have less for myself. Someone else will take care of them. It's the same question they ask, though. When, Lord, when? Then he will answer them, saying, truly, I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. Just think of the distinctions here in the questioning of these two groups. The first group is, is receiving a blessing. They're receiving life. They're receiving riches forevermore. And the, the, the Lord is saying, come. And they're saying, when? We didn't do that. We don't deserve that. We don't deserve life forevermore. They want to make sure that Jesus knows, I, I never fed you, Jesus. I never clothed you. Rather than defending themselves, they're actually arguing in a sense of like, we didn't do this. I don't want to receive reward for something I didn't do. But now in the second group, you have Jesus saying, you didn't do this. And they're like, well, well wait a minute. Hold up. I would have if I would have known. Why didn't you just tell me? Their questioning is more of a defense. Defending their own behavior against the judgment of a righteous king. You can't judge me like this. It doesn't matter when you find them, whether it's in childhood or adulthood or at the very end when they're standing before the judge, they do not agree with his counsel. They reject his teaching. During their life, Jesus says, come unto me. And they say, no thanks, I'm living my own life, thank you. And then at the end, he says, go away from me. And they say, wait a minute, I want to come in. Their heart is marked by rebellion. They do not love him. And when he finally gives them what their heart wants, which is separation from God, they say, hold on, wait a minute. I want life. No, you don't. No, you don't, because I gave you plenty of opportunities and you rejected every one of them. You spurned my counsel. You, you pushed away any attempts I made. So now you can have what your heart longs for, separation from God. I don't know whether this passage is, is exciting or sad. It's both, isn't it? I wrestled with this this week, thinking, is this something we should celebrate, or is this something I should weep over? What is the emotion evoked in this text, and it's both celebration and weeping? Because for me, and for many of you, you will experience life, and you will hear those words, come, 
Finally, receive your inheritance. But for others, they will hear, depart, go away from me. You don't have any part of me, and I don't have any part of you. And it'll stand that way forever. So much sadness and excitement all wrapped up in every passage. Then he will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. Verse 46, he summarizes for the disciples and for us, and these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. In one sentence, he he puts together both the concept of eternal punishment, which we know as hell, and eternal life, which we know of as heaven. Two concepts which dominate religious thought and belief. But it is becoming very, very popular to, to somehow erode away the offensiveness of eternal punishment. It's very popular to find ways around what that does to our sensibilities. Some say just, yeah, there is a hell, but it's not going to be populated with people because everyone will, will come to repent. Jesus will give people in that final day a, a second chance. He'll say, you know what? You're right. Now's your second chance. And they'll repent. Or some will say, and it's becoming popular to say this, that you know, hell is real, and you go there, but then you're just burnt up, and it's over, and it's, it's gone. You just are annihilated. But Jesus uses the same word to govern both concepts, life and death, heaven and hell. And it is eternal. So if you want to argue and you want to believe that hell is not forever, then you also have to conclude that either is heaven. You think hell is going to be just done and and gone in three seconds or three years or 3,000 years? Well, then so is heaven. Because Jesus uses the same Greek word, the same concept, the same amount of duration to govern both words. I know it's offensive. I know it makes us uncomfortable. So did Jesus. We don't have any right to change what he said. We have every right to come under that authority and to arrange our lives accordingly. If you don't like the fact that hell goes on forever, then reach out to your neighbors. Tell people about Christ so they don't have to go there. Don't change the concept of hell. Don't stop talking about it because it makes people uncomfortable. That's not what Christians do. Let's pray. Lord, I don't know whether to rejoice or to weep. So excited as I think about that scene, that glorious scene of you coming out of the clouds with all the angelic hosts. But it makes me terrified for those who yet do not know you. And all that we can ask, God, is that you would make us instruments in your hands, that you would make us holy and useful in this life, that you'd strip away all of our longings and lusts and and cravings for the things of this world so that we could be useful to you, so that our neighbors could hear the truth so that people could come to Christ. Please, Lord, 
Let us be useful to you so that the world will know. And if they will go to hell, let them, let them have to argue themselves out of heaven. But let us tell them. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, church. You are dismissed.